Masechet Ketubot Daf Peh Chet. The Mishnah listed a bunch of cases where a woman would have to make a swear in order to collect her Ketubah. In a normal case, she does not. She has a Ketubah, she presents it, she collects. However, Ed Echad Me'ida Shehi Peru'a. If the husband comes and says, I paid the Ketubah already, and I have one witness who testifies he was there and he saw the Ketubah being paid. Uh, in that case, she can testify, she can swear that she did not get paid and still collect. Her swear is uh, overrides the one witness. Now, what kind of swear is this? At first thought that this swear that she, that she makes is a deoraita required swear. Since the Pasuk says that one witness cannot rise up against any person to prove that he's guilty. One witness is not enough. You need two witnesses. Now, we uh, we infer from this, It's true, one witness is not believed that a person will be guilty and therefore requires whatever punishment that sin requires. But one witness is sufficient to be believed that it would require the other person to make a vow. And so we can see that we infer on a deoraita level, if there's one witness, one witness is not absolute proof, but one witness that says this was paid is enough to require the recipient, the woman here, to make a shivua, and therefore, you see, it's deoraita. And it was taught regarding this, this derasha, any place where two witnesses would require someone to pay, one witness is not enough to require to extract money, but it is enough to make a person uh, make an, take an oath. So there you go, that proves as deoraita. However, Amarava, Shete Tishuat Badava, Rava says, I reject this. Just like on the previous staff, Rava also rejected Ami Barchama uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the an, an impaired Ketubah. So to hear this Shivua uh, says, Hada de Kola Nishpain Shabatora, Nishpain Vilomishalamin, Vihi Nishbat Vinotelet. Number one, any de Oraita vow uh, is a vow that a person will make and not have to pay. It's the defendant making the vow uh, to, uh, to say, I don't owe you any money. And if he makes a vow, he doesn't have to pay. But in this case, it's the woman, the plaintiff. She is coming to collect money and she uh, makes she makes the vow and collects money. So that is not in the Doraita model. Therefore, that proves that it is the Rabbanan. And furthermore, uh, there is no Torah uh, vow when it involves land. And uh, since the Ketubah has a lien on land, therefore it can't be a Doraita vow, it must be the Rabbanan. El Amarava mid Rabbanan, Kedela Fista Toshel Baal. If it is Rabbanan, so why did the rabbis come up with this and impose this vow? It's to put the husband's mi- mind at ease. Uh, the husband has one witness that says he paid. It must be a case where. I mean, assume if the witness, if the husband knows he didn't pay, uh, then and he's trying to cheat her, her his husband, uh, then he doesn't really need to has mind to be at ease. He already knows. But we must be talking about a case where the husband doesn't quite remember whether he paid or not, and he has one witness that says that the that the husband did pay, and so now he says, "I don't want to pay again." But the vow, if if she's willing to make a vow and say that she was not paid, then the husband says, "Oh well, I guess I didn't pay," and then he'd be then therefore he's uh, willing to go ahead and make the payment of the ketubah. That's why the rabbis impose it upon her. Amar Rav Papa, i pikeachu meiti la lide shivua de oraita. So the Papa says, "I have a way in exactly this situation when the man, the husband, has one witness." And uh, and she says, no, sorry, you didn't pay me. And then, therefore, she's required to make this shivua de Rabbanan. What if he wants to make her take a shivua de Oraita? Why would he want to do that? Because a shivua de Oraita is much more severe. You bring out a Sefer Torah, and you make a vow on the Sefer Torah. So, you know, he wants the uh, the extra insurance that uh, of, of making her make a de Oraita level vow. Wait, what if he wants to do that? Here's how. What he should do is, he had one witness already that says that he paid the Ketubah once. He should go get yet another witness and pay her 
pay her, well, for the, you know, according to him, the second time, in front of that second man, second witness. And now you take the two witnesses together. There's one that he paid earlier. There's one that says he just paid now. And you take them together. Now there are two. And you have the two witnesses come and testify that for sure the kituva was paid. And then that will be the second payment he made, uh, will be for the Ketubah. And then he'll come and say, that payment that I gave you originally, that I claim that I paid you and I have one witness, I'm going to make that a loan. That won't be for your Ketubah payment. I'm going to assign it as a loan. Now, if a man comes, any person, with one witness that says, I lent um, that, uh, and says, I lent you money and you have to pay me back. Well then, if she denies it, she does have to make a shivua de oraita. And so there you go. That's how he, by converting the kituva payment that he already made, by actually paying again, this is a little paradoxical, because he has to take more money out of his pocket to pay again, um, and but by doing that, the kituvah is pay, taken care of. If uh, he makes a swear regarding her collecting the kituvah, that's only uh, the rabbanan. But if he turns it into a loan and he has one witness, well then she, that one witness is, is very strong. That is enough to require her to make a, a vow mid oraita that uh, she um, that she pay, paid it back or never received the loan and that's how he can make it a deoraita. Okay, so that um, uh, seems like a great strategy by Rav Papa. However, we're going to have a couple of iterations of this to refine the strategy. Matkif la Rav Shesha bere de Rav Idi. Rav Shesha says, how can you take one witness that saw one payment and join it together with a second witness that saw a different payment? These two witnesses witnessed two different events. They weren't there together at the same event, so they can't join together. So here's a little modification. What the husband does is he takes the witness that was there that claimed that he already paid her for the Ketubah earlier and bring that witness together with a second witness and have them stand there t together while the husband pays her according to him, for the second time. And then he says, this second payment here that I'm giving you is for your ketubah. So now he has two witnesses that he paid a ketubah. There's no doubt about that. And the first payment that he claims that he gave her, he will say, that was a loan to you, but now I want the loan back. And he does have one witness that he lent, that he gave her the money, and he's assigning it as a loan. And so if he gives, has one witness, that he gave her money, he can collect it and he can require her to make a vow, a deoraita, if she wants to, if she is going to deny the the payment. And so this is a better system. So you just need, you have to bring um, the first witness there together at the same time. We're going to find it further. Technically, she could still get out of it by saying there were two marriage contracts. He wrote one and then he wrote another one and he has to pay both in such a case. Um, this is, by the way, the reason why if someone loses a ketubah, we don't simply write a new one. We actually write a special one uh, that's, that is a replacement ketubah that says Says the first kituvah was lost, and this is a replacement. That way, um, she won't be if if she does find the first one, she won't be able to collect twice. Okay, so she could still say, "No, you owe me two kitubot, and the the first one that you had one witness for that was um, that was for the first kituvah. The second time that you just paid me with two witnesses was was for the other kituvah, and therefore uh, she can uh, still deny the uh, payment of the first kituvah." Uh, by uh, by by saying by making a shivua de rabbanan, and so it won't be necessarily clear that the witnesses saw the original kituva payment if she claims to. Ela Ravasheh says just add a tweak that the husband should inform the witnesses that listen, I am paying here for the own one and only original kituva. And the other payment that I made was only was only for a loan. As long as he tells the witnesses that, uh, then the witnesses are going to come. I saw her pay the kituvah, 
the Ketuvah only. And we're not going to believe her if she says, oh, there were two Ketuvahs, because that's a very rare that someone has two Ketuvahs and the witnesses um, didn't say, uh, and he told the witnesses beforehand, this is for the very first thing, the very same Ketuvah um, that I thought I, claimed, I paid before, I'm going to make that as a loan. This is the payment for the Ketuvah. So then she cannot make such a claim. So that's how a husband can make his wife make a Deoraita vow. Okay, now in the next part of the Mishnah said that if a woman is coming to collect her ketubah from leaned property, the husband had property that he sold, and now they divorce or he dies, and she wants to come and claim land, that land that he had sold, she can go to the purchasers of the land, collect the money, but to do that, she has to make a vow. We have a Mishnah in Masechet Shavuot. This Mishnah says that also orphans, if they want to collect money, let's say they, there was someone that owed the father money, and now the father died, and so now the orphans come and they want to collect money from someone, uh, they have to make an oath. The orphans have to make an oath also. So not only someone collecting from the orphans, but also the orphans, if they collect, have to take an oath. We want to clarify this Mishnah. Miman, who are they collecting from? Ilema midlove, they're going to the borrower and they're saying, hey, you have to pay our pay back what you what you our father lent you. Hashtavi henshakil belo shivua inu bishvua. Hold that doesn't make any sense because were the were the father alive, the father would be able to collect without making a vow. He has a loan document. You have a loan document, you can go and collect it. Now we're going to make the orphans take a vow. Usually we're a lot more lenient on the orphans. If someone wants to take collect from orphans, we make them swear. We like we want to protect the money of orphans. So why would we impose an added or a, a vow upon the orphans that the father himself wouldn't have to take. So that doesn't make sense. Rather, what this Mishnah is adding is that if one group of orphans is collecting money from another group of orphans, in other words, the two fathers, one borrowed from the other, both of the fathers die, and now the orphan, one is collecting from the other. Um, nevertheless, they have to, the orphans that are collecting have to make a vow from the orphans that are paying. Uh, otherwise, normally, if they were collecting not from orphans, then they wouldn't have to. So the vechen is extending what our Mishnah says. Anyone who collects from orphans has to make a vow. And this Mishnah says, including if the collectors are themselves orphans, they still have to make a vow. So Rav Yudah is making a limitation on this Mishnah Shavuot and said, when do the Yatomim who are collecting have to make a vow? Um, only uh, 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 if they say um, that the Loshanu uh, Shamru Yatomim that their father said claims that yes, I borrowed, but I pay, but we paid back. So if the fathers, uh, the fa- the orphans of the borrower. Uh, uh, say that our father said, told us that yes, there was there was a, a, a there was a loan, but we paid it back already. Then the orphans who are collecting do have to make a vow. But if the the ones who are being collected from they 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 say our father told us before he died that he never borrowed money from you at all. Then then even if the orphans collecting make an oath, they cannot be, get, get paid at all because the other orphan said there was never any vow. There's no there was never any loan, so we're not paying you at all. Okay, this is one version, but matkif ladava adraba kol amed lo laviti ki amed lo parati dame. That's not the law of someone who denies a loan. If I come and I have a, I have a, a, you know, some kind of proof. I have a contract that says you owe me money, and you say no, I, I, I never borrowed any money from you. That's the same as saying I never. It's the same as admitting that you never paid any money at all. Um, because by saying there was never a loan. You're, you're certainly admitting that you never paid back the loan. You never made any payment. So in that case, I have proof that there is a loan here, and you just admitted that you never paid anything. So as actually, you're more responsible if you say that there was never a loan than if you say there was a loan, but I paid back. 
So rather we have to fix the statement, Ela it mar hachi it mar. Amarav zedika mar rav Yehuda. Lo shanu ela shamru yetomim. We all the the orphans who are collecting have to make a vow only when Amalanu Abba Laviti Uparati when the orphans of the borrower said, Yes, we did borrow, but we paid it back, then the orphans of the collectors make a vow and they can collect. Aval Amru, Amalanu Abba Lo Laviti, but if the orphans of the defendant here uh, say, our father said that he never gave any loan at all, then the orphans who are collecting can collect even without making a vow, because because anyone who says, uh, we didn't borrow anything, when the lender has proof that there was a loan, that's the same as actually admitting that they did not repay a cent, and therefore the orphans collecting can collect even without a vow. So it went from the, went from being one going to one from one extreme to the exact opposite. Uh, which makes um, uh, this one, the second one here, now makes more sense according to uh, the Ravas principle. All right, next part of the Mishnah says, V'nifrat shelo befanav lo titpara, titpara ela bishvua. If a case where a husband and wife got divorced, and after the divorce, before the husband pays the ketubah, he goes to a foreign country, and she wants to collect her ketubah. So she goes to whoever is managing his estate, and collects from it, she has to make a vow. Because the hus- if the husband was around, she can collect. She has a ketubah. She doesn't have to vow. But if the husband's not around, she has to make a vow that the husband didn't pay it already. Amad of Acha Sar Habira. Maaseh ba lifnei rabi Yitzhak be'antiochia be'antiochia ve'amar lo shanu ela lichtubat isha mishum hina aval ba'al chob lo So a certain case uh, came uh, before the Yitzhak in, in the city of Antioch. And he said that this law that a person has to vow in order to collect when the uh, guy is not around, that's only for a ketubah. Um, uh, because of, of china, the sages want men to find favor in the eyes of women. So to ensure that women would want to marry, they said that uh, this is uh, going to be a benefit for her that she'll be able to collect um, as even with the husband is not there, as long as she makes a shivua. But if it's a regular loan of not not a woman collecting your kituva, but two people, and one comes and he wants to collect money from the other, but the other guy is away on a trip, then the um, the the one collecting cannot get paid at all um, until the guy comes back. Even if he makes an oath, no, it's no good because uh, who who's who, maybe maybe you're lying. Wait till he comes back. So this is a leniency that we give to women so that they will be encouraged to marry knowing that even if the husband runs away, they'll be able to collect with his estate, albeit with, a, with an oath, but better than not being to able to collect at all. All right, that's, the, that's that statement. Averava Amar of Nachman, Rava disagrees and says, Afilu Baal Chob, Shelo Yeh Kol Echad Ve'echad, Notel Me'otav Shelcha Berov Ve'olech Ve'yoshev, Bimedinat Hayam, Ve'ata Noal Delet Pifne Lovin. Rava Nehmer of Nachman says, this leniency applies even to a regular loan document um, that if um, I, I lend you money and now I want to collect but you you went away you moved to a different country so now what am I going to do I can still the leniency applies any case I can make a vow and collect from whoever's running your estate why uh, so that uh, we won't have people who will go borrow money and then they'll skip town and uh, the lender won't be able to collect and then uh, lenders won't want to want to lend money anymore because they know. I mean, I know I'm going to lend this guy money. He's going to go move to a different country. I'll never see my see my money again. And uh, and then they're not going to loan lend anymore. And that'll be actually bad for borrowers. It'll be bad for the whole economy. And therefore, uh, the uh, the law is that anyone, both a woman collecting ketuba and a lender who's recollecting his debt, if the guy isn't there, then they can make a vow and collect from his estate. Rabbi Shimon Omer, the last part of the Mishnah had a cryptic statement by Rabbi Shimon uh, that said, well, whenever she claims her ketubah, 
um, then the heirs administer an oath and she could collect her ketubah. But when she is not collecting her ketubah, was the rest of the statement, uh, then the heirs do not, cannot make her take a vow. So what case is Rabbi Shimon talking about? Rabbi Shimon Ahaya, which clause of the Mishnah earlier, there were three clauses of the Mishnah, which one was Rabbi Shimon talking about, that he disagrees? Aha, it's uh, referring to the, the very last statement, the one that we were just discussing. When the Mishnah said that she can, uh, when she collects her ketubah, and the husband is away, he's alive, because they just got divorced, but he's, he's alive, but he's away. Um, she has to make a vow. And uh, according to Tanakama, that is, applies to collecting anything. If she wants to collect uh, food, because the husband uh, the still uh, has, to, has to pay for her food, or she wants to collect her ketubah, she wants to get the one lump sum now and take the ketubah, no matter what, whatever she wants to collect, uh, she has to make a vow. But Rabbi Shimon comes and disagrees and says, if she is collecting her, her ketubah from the heirs, now we introduce heirs here, we're going to ask about this in a second, um, uh, because the, the case on the end of the Mishnah was not talking about heirs, but when actually when he's alive. So the, the language doesn't quite fit, which, uh, so we will reject this. But right now, we're saying, Rabbi Shimon disagrees and says, anytime she's uh, collecting her ketubah, then the heirs can make her vow. And uh, Tobat Ketubata, but if she's collecting not her vow, not her ketubah, but something else, like her mezonot, and Yoshin Mashbi'in Ota, then he they he, he she does not have to make a vow. So Tanakama says uh, she always has to make a vow, even if it's for collecting other things. The Bishimon says no, she only has to make a vow for Kituba and not for the other things. And this would parallel another machloket between the uh, Rabbi Nim Hanan and the children of the Kohanim Gedolim who had their own opinion. We have a Mishnah later on. It says, A man who's alive, but he went away on a trip. And so, uh, uh, and so, therefore, he still has required to feed her, even though he's away. And she comes and says, hey, give me food. Hanan says, she only has to make a vow at the end, at the end of the marriage, uh, when she collects her ketuvah, she'll make a vow that she did not collect anything that wasn't coming to her beforehand. But right now, when she's coming to collect her sustenance, she does not have to make a vow, meaning she can collect sustenance without a vow. Um, but the Mishnah continues that the sons of the Kohanim disagreed with Hanan and they said she has to make a claim she has to make a vow now when she wants the sustenance and also when she comes to collect the ketubah she has to make another vow for to make sure that she didn't uh, partially collect her ketubah beforehand. Uh, so that we already see here that there is a machloket about when uh, collecting sustenance, whether she has to make a vow or not. Rabbi Shimon kehanan. Rabbi Shimon say, who says she has to make a vow only for ketubah but not for sustenance, that will be the same as Hanan who says that she does not have to make a vow at the time of collecting. Rabbanan kibne kohanim gedolim. And Rabbanan would uh, be the same as kohanim gedolim who that say yeah, she has to make a vow both for the ketubah at the end and when she wants sustenance, she has to make a vow then as well. Okay, so all that is the first uh, explanation of Rabbi Shimon, but we reject it. Matkif l'arav sheshat. Hayoshin mashpinota, betin mashpinota mi ba'ele. Hey, you shouldn't use the language, uh, Rabbi Shimon used the language of that the orphans can make her take a vow. But the case, that last case of the Mishnah was not talking about when he's dead, it was talking about when he's alive, but he went to a different country. And so it doesn't involve orphans, and therefore it doesn't fit the language. So a second try, again, the Rabbi Shimon's statement at the end of the Mishnah, what is it referring to? 
אהה, הלכה, הלכה מקבר בעלה לבית אביה, או שחזרה לבית חמיה, ולא נעשית אפוטרופיה, אין היושין משפיעין אותה. ואם נעשית אפוטרופיה, יושין משפיעין אותה על העתיד לבוא, ואין משפיעין אותה על מה שעבר. רבי שמעון here at the end of this, our משנה, is actually going back to a previous משנה, back on uh, דף פו. And if you remember that משנה says that um, a- after the husband dies, if she goes straight from the cemetery to her father's house, she never went back home, no chance of her stealing anything, or even if she went back to her in-law's house and she was not made an administrator, so she didn't have access to embezzle the, uh, the accounts or the estate, then the heirs... Uh, meaning his, whoever uh, inherits him, his sons, cannot make her take a vow because she didn't have access to embezzle. But if she was made an administrator uh, over the estate, the father during his lifetime said, I want you to be an administrator after I die, then the uh, heirs can make her take a vow on what happens from then on, from the death and on on, although the heirs cannot make her take a vow if she was already appointed an administrator during his lifetime. Uh, during his lifetime, that's between him and her. If he, he suspe- the father suspected her, then he could make her take a vow. But uh, the heirs can only make her take a vow if she, on her being an administrator after the death of the father. That is the Mishnah earlier, and this is the Rabbi Shimon is arguing on that. Why is Rabbi Shimon mentioned all the way here and not above? It's a good question. But anyway, that's what he's talking about. Rabbi Shimon says, no, I disagree. You, Tanakh Ahmed, said that the heirs can make her take a vow. Just for being an administrator, the Bishamon says no. If she comes to claim her ketubah, then yes, the the um, the heirs can say anytime you want to collect from heirs, you have to make a vow. Uh, but if she's not coming to collect her ketubah, she's just administrating the property. Then the heirs have no right to make her take a vow. And this machloket between Tanakhama and Bishamon. Parallels another machloket that we know of from a Mishnah Gitin. Vekami palge beplugdat abad Shaul v'Rabanan ditnan. A potropos sheminau abi etomim yishaba minuhu bedin lo yishaba. We have a machloket here between uh, Tanakama and Abba Shaul. Uh, Tanakama says that if um, there was an administrator appointed by the father of the uh, orphans, he says, "Listen, when I die, I want you to take care of the estate." That guy, that administrator, has to make a vow to the orphans um, when the orphans grow up and they say, hey, did you embezzle any property this whole time? He, they can make him take a vow. But if the Betin appointed someone, then he cannot ma- take a vow. Uh, the reason would be that, uh, you know, if a person, if the Betin asks you to do something and you know you're going to have to make a vow and because you're not going to be trusted, then people aren't going to want to be an administrator. I don't want to do a favor and be an administrator and then make, make me take a vow. So therefore, if the Betin asks them, uh, it's a public service, so we don't make the person make a vow. Whereas if the father did, then he does have to make a vow. That's Tanakama. Abba Shaul Omed, Chiluf HaDevarim, Minu Betin Yishaba, Minahu Abhi Yitomim Lo Yishaba. Abba Shaul says the opposite. If it's the Betin that appointed him, he should make a vow. A person, you know, he feels honored that, oh, the Betin, uh, uh, trust me. So he'll do it, and uh, that he's okay with making a vow so that he's beyond suspicion. Uh, whereas if the father of the orphans appointed someone, presumably the father knows who he and trusts the person he appointed. It's the father's own estate. Who cares more about the, his estate than he himself? He wants to, of course, wants to make sure that his kids will be taken care of. So he's going to pick someone that he knows is 100% trust, trustworthy, and, not, and therefore the orphans do not need to, and therefore cannot, make him take a vow. That's Abba Shaul who says the opposite. So we can line them up. Rabbi Shimon, Kaba Shaul, Rabbi Shimon, in our Mishnah, who says that the orphans can make her, make, take a, kit, make a, a vow only to collect her, her ketubah, but not for any other reason, not for being an administrator. That's like Abba Shaul that says if a father uh, appoints the administrator, the administrator does not have to make a vow. Whereas, um, Rabbanan, ke Rabbanan, uh, the rabbis here in this uh, Mishnah in Gitin will say that if the father 
chose the administrator. They do have to make a vow. That would be the same as the rabbis in the Mishnah that disagree with Rabbi Shimon um, and say that he does have to make a vow. Okay, so this is our second explanation, but we're still not happy. Matkif la abaye. Hi, calls the man she tobat ke tubata im tobat mi ba mi ba ele. Rabbi says that this does not fit the language of the Mishnah. In the language of the Mishnah, it sounds like Rabbi Shimon is being more machmir um, because uh, he says calls the man any time she collects her ketuba, she has to make a vow. Sounds like he's adding more vows to her. And um, uh, so, if you want it to be lenient, it should say oh, only. If uh, tovat me by the only if she collects her kituba, only then she has to pay. Uh, she has to make a vow, but not in another case. So the language of the Mishnah sounds like Rabbi Shimon is more stringent, requiring more oaths upon the woman than Tanakama, and therefore Abaye gives a um, another explanation. El Amar Abaye, aha. Katabla neder ushboa en li alaich. Abbe thinks that Rabbi Shimon is also going on an earlier Mishnah where the husband uh, 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 gives an oath waiver. He writes in the Ketubah, you have no vows uh, for me. Um, you, know, right, I, you will not have to make any vows uh, because of me. And In that case, he, the husband, cannot uh, force the wife to make any vows. Remember that Mishnah continued and uh, brought the more, more elaborate case, and even more elaborate case. And the most elaborate case was when he says, you have no vows not uh, by me and not my inheritors and not anyone who acts on my behalf and they will none of us will have any vows against you or your inheritors or anyone who comes on your behalf like someone who buys the right to ketu or ketuva and yachol hashpi'a lo hu velo yirosha velo ba'in b'rshuto lo hi velo yirosha velo ba'in b'rshuta if man says that formula then in fact he cannot make or take a vow nor can his uh, um, uh, inheritors, nor those who represent him, and they cannot not make, they cannot force a vow upon her or her inheritors or anyone who represents her. Rabbi Shimon disagrees with this and says, um, and says more lenient for her that. Um, actually more stringent for her, right? Abbe said that Rabbi Shimon's language is more stringent. And so there, and Rabbi Shimon says, even if the husband gives this whole long language, no vows ever, nobody's going to make any vows to anyone. Nevertheless, when she comes to collect her ketubah from the orphans, if her husband dies, she has to make a vow because there's an absolute rule across the board, anyone collecting from orphans, has to has to make a vow because we have to protect the orphan and that overrides any condition that the husband made in the language of the ketubah and this this machloka between Tanakh and Rabbi Shimon would parallel another controversy between remember Abba Shaul ben Ima Miriam and the rabbis uh, that had the very same uh, controversy Rabbi Shimon Kaba Shaul Rabbi Shimon says who says here that the orphans always can demand a vow whenever someone collects that's exactly what Abba Shaul ben Ima Miriam said that she has to make a vow anytime anyone's collecting from the orphans including the the wife have to make ketubah and the rabbanan here that say no if you if you made a condition that she doesn't have to make a vow then she doesn't make a vow that would parallel the rabbis who argued with abba shaul Okay, that was Abaye's answer, and now we're going to have one last answer. Matkif la Rav Papa, Rav Papa rejects Abaye. Hatenach calls the man shetobat ketubata. You explained the first clause of Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon's full clause was calls the man shetobat ketubata hayoshimish binota. If she's collecting her ketuba, any time she's collecting ketuba, the uh, the heirs can make her pay. You explained that half very well. 
And Rav Paz is going to agree with that interpretation that he's talking about the, the same subject as Abba Shel Ben Miriam. But Rav Papa tells Abaye, you didn't explain the second half of Rabbi Shimon, who said, Im enatobat ketubat af, she's not collecting her ketubah, then the heirs cannot make her take a vow. What is that referring to? So, atenach kozim ha-shabat kibata, enatobat ketubata, ma'ika lememar, ela amara papa, la poke medirabi eli ezer, so he says the first half is as you said Abaye is to uh, is about the machloket of Abba Shaul, but the second half that says if she's not collecting her ketubah, then the heirs cannot make her take a vow. That's going back to the Mishnah of the Bi Eli Ezer, where where the Chachamim against Rabbi Eliezer said that if a man makes his wife into a storekeeper or a steward administrator over the house, then he can make her swear that she's not embezzling funds. Um, but uh, otherwise, he cannot. And, um, and Rabbi Eliezer said there, even if she is not made a storekeeper or uh, administrator, the husband can come anytime and say, hey, did you steal any dough? I see you needing some dough. You, I see you spinning some wool. Did you steal any wool? Rabbi Eliezer says that, that he can make her take a vow at any time. Rabbi Shimon here comes and says, I disagree both with Rabbi Eliezer and those who dispute him. And I say, Rabbi Shimon says, that a man can never make his wife take a vow except for orphans uh, when she wants to collect a ketubah. If he dies, she wants to collect a ketubah, then the orphans can say, make a vow. But... Um, a, a vow regarding her uh, t- taking dough or wool or even if she's made an administrator or storekeeper no the husband cannot make her take a vow for that and for sure the uh, and and the heirs also cannot make her take a vow uh, that uh, about anything that happened during the marriage um, that she didn't embezzle or take anything. And so that's what Rabbi Shimon is coming in the second half of his statement. The first half, I agree, that's talking about that Rabbi Shimon agrees with Abba Shaul, but the second half of the statement is to show that Rabbi Shimon says no vows at all uh, can the husband or his heirs make upon her for embezzling not dough and not the cash register. Baruch Adonai Amen Amen.